This session aims to advance our understanding of the value of different forms of science and evidence. For the next half hour, I look forward to a vigorous panel discussion, and I'd love for you as an audience to put your questions and comments into the Slido box, and I will direct them to our panel. Just a reminder, you can type in new questions by pushing the big green ask button, or you can vote for ones that are already there and raise its priority. I'm now going to introduce our other panelists. Firstly, Professor Ian Anderson. A bit over 30 years ago, as a fresh-faced University of Melbourne medical student, I was in awe of this slightly older student who'd published his doctorate of medical science thesis as a bright blue paperback text called Curie Health in Curie Hands. It's now a classic text. That student was Ian Anderson, now Professor Ian Anderson, a Palawa man from the northwest coast of Tasmania, who is currently Deputy Vice Chancellor for Student and University Experience at ANU. So I still get to look up to him as a big brother. Ian has held numerous senior clinical, academic, and government leadership responsibilities, including two decades associated with the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service as an Aboriginal health worker, a doctor, a chief executive officer and board member. Roles at the University of Melbourne, including Foundation Chair of Indigenous Health, Foundation Chair of Indigenous Higher Education and Pro Vice Chancellor Engagement. And then Deputy Secretary of Indigenous Affairs in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and Deputy Chief Executive of the National Indigenous Australians Agency. He has also chaired the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Equality Council and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Higher Education Council. Ian became an officer of the Order of Australia in 2017 and the following year was appointed a fellow of both the Academy of Social Sciences and the Academy of Health and Medical Sciences. Our third panelist is one of Australia's most recognisable experts through the pandemic, Professor Jody McVernon. Jody has led the modelling at the Doherty Institute that has informed the federal government responses. She's a physician with subspecialty qualifications in public health and vaccinology and has extensive expertise in clinical vaccine trials, epidemiologic studies and mathematical modelling of infectious diseases some of which she gained from time at Oxford University. In 2004, Jody established a modelling and simulation unit at the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health, and its work on influenza and pertussis influenced policy throughout the Australian Government Office of Health Protection, the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunization, Immunization and the World Health Organization. Her work focuses on the application of a range of cross-disciplinary methodological approaches including mathematical and computational models to synthesize insights from basic biology, epidemiological data, and sociological research. These models advance understanding of the observed epidemiology of influenza and other infectious diseases and inform understanding of optimal interventions for disease control. In 2015, Jody launched an NHMRC Center of Research Excellence in Infectious Diseases Modeling known as PRISM. And Jody was admitted to the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences this year. Congratulations, Jody, and welcome. It's an honour to have you on board. I wonder if perhaps first up, I can ask for your reflections, brief reflections um, on Camelini's presentation and, and perhaps also on uh, Dr. Fauci and Sharon Lewin's <laughs> presentation earlier, um, if you are present, and, uh, and perhaps Jody, I might go to you first and then Ian, I'll come, come to you. And then uh, we'll go to the audience questions. Jody, over to you. Thanks, Russell. So apologies that I wasn't present for, for, um, for the Fauci presentation, but, but certainly to Kamalini's. And I think um, as you relayed in your sort of description of our work, I think for models to be useful, they need to be able to capture, you know, all of these various elements of basic biology, but also um, the social determinants of 
health and also responses to disease. And I think it's very important what we've we've managed to achieve over 15 years of work with government is really thinking through in a very participatory way what some of the underlying problems and determinants are and what types of responses can be used for disease control. And I think, you know, one of the sort of critical strategic um, outputs of our work back at the start of 2020 was the public health responses are critical, but for pathogens like COVID, like flu, where so much transmission occurs before individuals even know that they have disease, that these case-based responses are not sufficient. They are very important, you know, we'll continue uh, to persist with our case finding responses in Australia as we move forward into the next phase of, of living with COVID, but that, you know, these overlying social mobility behavioural changes were going to be needed to control that disease without vaccination. And so, you know, I think even as we move into this next phase, as we reopen our borders, as we, we move into a, a more confident time when vaccination modifies substantially this disease in our population, we still need to keep those lessons in mind. And, and as Carmelini points out, we, we've identified and are continuing to work with government on the, the heterogeneity of impacts of COVID at baseline and under vaccination, and even with social measures in place, that endorse and support those wraparound supports for isolation, quarantine, you know, the community engaged responses that really support vaccination and other public health response efforts. So I think, um, you know, all of those concepts come together and, and really uh, models provide a quantitative logic framework uh, to really bring those things together and drive some of those messages home. Thanks, Jodie. Ian, can I refer to you? Okay, um, so um, maybe two, two high-level comments, and um, I'm um, familiar with the kind of argument and evidence that Camelini has presented and very strongly endorsed it. I just want to make a couple of points around nuance. Um, the, the evidence around the social determinants of health and social inequalities and health outcomes is profoundly strong and well-traveled and, and well-known. But there is a, a critical gap in our evidence around intervention. Uh, so particularly what's missing is not, not epidemiological analysis, it's actually a socio sociological analysis of the distribution of power and how that impacts on intervention points. And that's not something which you can do in generic and in abstract, but you actually need to look at institutional systems in Australia, in the US, and how power works. Because it's only there that you can actually start to explain why um, the system of the response in the US, apropos Navajo Indian populations, was so appallingly wrong, uh, and known very early to be appallingly wrong, which whilst in some respects, the, the system response in parts of the response to Indigenous Australia was fundamentally right. Um, so it needs to be very contextual to the institutional systems in which you operate, not into the generic systems, uh, understanding how a federation works, understanding, uh, for example, the role of the National Virus Security Act in providing certain levers and not, uh, and then understanding where you can um, um, res respond in real time, particularly to an e epidemic. I want to come back to that. So, so for example, um, um, uh, the, the, the federal government had a, was developing a strong partnership with Indigenous organisations, with community controlled organisations, that partnership had just been agreed at National Cabinet. It gave uh, the basis for those organisations, well, sorry, it was about to be agreed, very close to being agreed, and it gave the basis of those organisations to reach out very early and insist that the federal government uh, implement the first phase of the COVID response in partnership with that sector. And that, that evidence for that is quite strong. Uh, and it meant that the early COVID response it was probably as good as you can get. You could look at uh, 
the response around vaccination in Western New South Wales and wonder how, why that was so wrong. Well, part of that was because the institutional power around vaccination, vaccination rested at that point with state governments, not with the federal government. Our state governments who did have partnership with Indigenous organisations, but choose to make allocationary decisions that favoured their interests over the interests of people in Western New South Wales and reallocate vaccine resources into central Sydney. So I guess what I'm saying here is that it's not enough to understand the impact of power inequality and determinants of health. If you're actually going to address them, you kind of need to be able to work backwards. And that's not, and, and the epidemiological evidence is insufficient. Uh, another way of saying this is often that we know that there's a very strong uh, inarguable correlation between poor housing and health outcomes. I have never yet seen an Indigenous housing intervention that shows a measurable improvement in Indigenous health outcomes. Now, that's not because it's not there. It's because it actually is not the same once you know there's a correlation to be able to know what you need to do and the evidence framework about how you might intervene. The, the other point I would make um, is that um, there, there are, there's such a significant difference between the kind of endemics that are play in health inequality, where you've got long form interventions and long form strategies that you can roll out. So, you know, the, the recent evidence of SNIBI and Indigenous life expense is an example of 30 years of work around addressing some of those fundamental structural imbalances. The challenge of a pandemic is that you've got to do it now. You can't wait for 30 years to uh, address some of those fundamental inequalities. inequalities. You can be better prepared to frame your response, but you've got to think about real-time decision-making, which again is another set of interventions. How, how do we rapidly address those structural inequalities? There is no surprises in the pattern of the pandemic in Australia. Absolutely none. Who would have thought that West Melbourne was going to struggle. Well, you know, so, so how, do, how do we, in our real-time fast responses, put in place corrective interventions that address the things that we all knew was going to happen? Well, well assumed was going to happen, um, and, but that's, that's, that's a different um, set of responses than we might do than if we've got the privilege of working in chronic disease and long, long form challenges around raising educational outcomes and improving employment and um, um, other opportunities that we know will in the longer term address, uh, provide a, bit, a better base for reducing inequalities. So two comments. Thanks, Ian. And uh, Kamalina, I might ask you in a moment to respond, but perhaps just build it into Paul Miles's question, which has got a few thumbs ups. We said, thank you, Camelini. Wonderful refocusing our thinking. Do you have faith in a better Australian response with community engagement to the next pandemic? I think we've already seen that. So, um, Ian, you mentioned Western Sydney and what we saw consistently, you know, Blacktown, Canterbury, Bankstown went from areas with the lowest vaccine coverage to the highest. And uh, that was largely based, you know, once structural barriers like availability of the vaccine was addressed, it was based on community-led response. And I think, I think going back to what you said as well, governments need to hand over, just talking about community engagement is meaningless. I think real community partnership requires the evolution of power and control. And, you know, simple things. So, Jody, you mentioned um, the heterogeneity of uh, disease transmission. We, we know that from all outbreaks in the past, and we've known that for COVID, but, you know, we had very flat targets, 70%, 80 um, percent. And what we saw is that 70 percent could mean 20 percent in one community a usually structurally disadvantaged community and 95% in another, almost certainly the, the, the most wealthy and resourced. And I think we need to hand, part of that is handing over data sovereignty. So 
communities need to know what their vaccine coverage is, what and, and that needs to be built into the way we make policy. So we've seen in New Zealand, they're shifting now from those flat targets to every, I think, every council, every, every local government area needs to meet those thresholds for them to move forward to the next step. So I, 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 am, I am optimistic because I think, you know, what we see in the mainstream is Australians, you know, again, there was discussion early on about can we reach 70%, look at what's happening in other countries. I had no doubt Australia would get there because we, we have a community that is, expects, you know, and trusts largely the health system and that's through long-term programs like Medicare. And I, I think that's, that's the relationship we now need to achieve for uh, uh, the groups that are at risk of being left behind. So I'll stop there, Russell. Okay. I can speak on this for a long time, but I'll stop. J Jody, can, can for all of us as benefit, can you uh, indicate what sort of granularity of the sort of structural disadvantage information goes into the modeling scenarios? So we were very clear in our first report, Russell, that you know, in setting a national target coverage threshold, it, it was really about identifying the point at which we expected vaccines would not produce herd immunity. We made it clear that vaccines alone would not keep us safe from COVID, but that they'd reduce transmission to a level that would make it manageable with, with those related supports. And our first report was very clear that we were assuming homogeneity of coverage that small area coverage was going to be a critical determinant of ongoing risk. And actually our work prompted the reporting of vaccination at small area level uh, as part of the routine reporting of the program. So in, in moving forward, I mean, there's work that's ongoing at the moment for, for National Cabinet, so I can't discuss it in detail, but it does very much focus on these small areas and really thinking about what the additional uh, wraparound supports and interventions would be. We're obviously working closely with health and others, but it's making the quantitative case for those things. Um, and, and then what additional targeted measures and environments you can uh, look at to, to really help to support those whole of population approaches. So um, yeah, the work doesn't all get done at granular level from the beginning, but that's definitely been a, a big part of our work moving forward. Mm, thanks so much. Uh, John Myberg asked a question that's really around a global perspective on inequity. Uh, and particularly in relation to vaccine access. That's a major threat to containing the pandemic. I'm interested in, in your views um, about uh, the global distribution problem and our role. And I, I just think uh, there's another question further down that is about what can we as an academy do to further advocate for vaccines being made for low and middle income countries? So Kamalini, maybe I'll direct that to you first up. So, uh, as I said, one of the most important barriers is um, intellectual and patent property protections, and that's not just in relation to the vaccine. So, what we've seen over the last, you know, decade or so is concentration of every aspect of vaccine development. So, you know, even things like the plastic bags in which mRNA vaccines are grown are patented, and those patents are held with a small number of um, developed country pharmaceutical manufacturers. So I think the, you know, what my, I, I started in clinical medicine at a time when we didn't have antiretrovirals, then a period where, you know, I'd work in Australia where there was access to them. And then I'd go to places where there was no hope of access. And that changed because of activists, patients fighting for access to generic uh, antiretrovirals and we need the same and we need all of our countries to support that. Australia has just said that they will support the TRIPS waiver that was put to the WTO uh, last year by uh, a range of countries. The US uh, Trade um, Secretary said they were going to support that months ago. I think it's a, it's a good step forward but we really need to see and the, the one opportunity that these sorts of diseases provide is that they stop us paying lip service to things and really nobody cares if you've had a round table or a you know <laughs> a workshop on uh, access to essential medicines if case numbers are going up everywhere uh, what they what people can really see is is what you're trying to do working and 
I think it is an opportunity to say we all have a vested interest in controlling transmission everywhere. Uh, without that, we'll always be following, we'll always be behind COVID. And I think those steps of lifting, ensuring generic access, as we've done for other diseases in the past, and then allowing and supporting um, developing countries with man vaccine manufacturing capacity to scale up production. And as well in the region for Australia to scale up its production of vaccines um, so that, that we can supply our region. Thanks, Kamalini. I'm gonna keep moving through and get us through as many of these questions as we can. Keep them coming in, keep your voting going. Emily Banks, I uh, might direct this one to you, Ian. Um, what are the practical steps we can take as researchers to value and encourage research that makes a difference to structural disadvantage? Okay, so steps. Russell, I might um, respond in part to the previous question and then segue into that. So um, one of the challenges in finding pathways to respond into the regulation of particularly big pharma is that um, is that these are large corporations. They largely operate in the global unregulated space. Um, there has been some attempts by the United Nations to build more ethical and regulated global business practice. Most of that is focused on issues such as supply chains, um, slavery, um, diversity and equity. Um, but none of that actually focuses around public health outcomes such as um, health inequality. So, so I think there, there are some long form practical intervention points, but it's actually through, and, and there are, there are th th these are global networks. We have an Australian network here in Australia, um, uh, joined up by many of the BCA companies who are working through how to be better global citizens, um, but largely out, work, working outside the regulatory frameworks of domestic governments. Uh, on, on, the, on the second question, which I've now forgotten. <laughs> what, what are the practical steps we can take as researchers to value and encourage research that makes a difference to structural disadvantage? So, so I think the first thing is um, um, recognise that there are some discipline limitations in, in epidemiology. So epidemiology really doesn't have the entire toolkit to understand uh, distribution of power. M much of that's in disciplines like sociology. So I, I would say practically tr try to build those disciplinary collaborations that ena enable us to not just be really good at observing problems, but actually understanding how we address power, how we, how we work backwards, walk backwards, as I said earlier. And th that I think is partly a sociological uh, problem, but also public policy and other um, disciplines. I think that the other practical strategy is um, that was alluded in the earlier conversation is actually find, find ways to work in true collaboration with groups as researchers uh, from, pe from people from disadvantaged groups, um, the sorts of groups in Western Sydney or Western Melbourne, Indigenous Australians, how, how to work, how to reframe research practice to be truly collaborative uh, so that you can build stronger community grounded insights and also build mechanisms from the ground up that enable and strengthen your community engagement, your research translation, all those sort of things. So I think there are some very practical strategies which the Australian research community and particularly the public health community are already well and truly onto, dig down and, and, and do that more. Thanks. And Jody, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, I completely uh, agree, Ian. And and I think, um, you know, the it, it's about the power structures. It's also about information and the power of information and the sources of information. And I think we've seen um, in some of the challenges we've had in responses how, how misinformation is spread. You know, we've had strong anti-vaccine messages coming out of religious groups in North America um, that have been taken up in some sectors and, and lots of other sort of um, ways of understanding, you know, the basis of knowledge and the basis of response. Because, you know, frankly, the difference between Australia's epidemic and the US epidemic has been a basically cohesive community response. 
um, to a to a public health crisis. You know, none of it would have worked if the community hadn't cooperated with what they were being asked to do. So, yeah, working out you know in the future how to how to make longer term change and remove some of those inequities is clearly complex to unpack. And I think one of the the absences in Australia that is in the UK system is having a standing social sciences advisory group to government on pandemic management which um, they have a standing modelling group and a social sciences group. We don't have that. And we've had some great people in Australia who've been contributing to work, but it's not as formally acknowledged as, a, as an entity. And in fact, you know, so many of the things that have, have helped us are things like, you know, job keeper, job seeker, financial supports for people to isolate and quarantine and test. Um, these have been economic levers to support um, a community response. But um, we, we haven't had the sort of structural processes in there to, to speak to those as well. So that's a, a nice lead into the next question, which, Cameline, I'll direct to, to you. It comes from Louise Bohr. Welcome to the Academy, Louise. Um, you discussed integration of health and disease prevention surveillance. Was this important in responses of different Australian states? I guess the question is really around, was there very variation between the states and, and was that material? So the, the routine disease surveillance system, uh, I'm not really clear on the question. I think it's really feeding off what was a, a powerful point you made about the importance of integrating epidemiology into health. Yeah, and I think um, it's going back to the points I made and what Jody just said too, that, um, you know, all of this relies on that social contract. So, um, you know, what 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 has always been fundamentally understood for me from other settings is that people will not report disease if they see no benefit in doing so, or if the result is that their 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 mother is taken away to somewhere they can't see her and often, you know, in, in other outbreaks will die. Um, we, we forget that we think about the tools of a surveillance system or the tools of a health reporting system. We don't realize that the most important component of that is that relationship between the person experiencing disease and the, and the individual who will report. And if that individual is a, you know, is a, is a, health bureaucrat sitting in a health department calling you and saying, you know, we know you've got COVID, I'm an authorised officer, and you are obliged to report where you went in the last two weeks, as opposed to that's their general practitioner who, or, or their community nurse who delivered their baby, who dresses their mother's chronic ulcer. And that person starts with, I know you've got COVID, you must be terrifying for you and your family. How can I support you? And at the end of that conversation, he says, and by the way, critical to keeping you and your community safe is for me to understand where you went in the last two weeks. Now, everyone can understand the difference between those two uh, interactions, but I think what we haven't done is operationalize that. So I don't know if that answers the question, but to me- a Great answer. Yep. I'm going to now throw to Hugh Taylor's question. It's been 100 years, Jody, since the Spanish flu to COVID. How long do you think it will take for the next pandemic? A while. <laughs> Not a long awesome. while or a short while? <laughs> Prediction is hard, particularly about the future. I mean, clearly we're, we've created the circumstances for, for emerging diseases far more frequently than in the past. And you know, all of us were prepared for an influenza-like something. There'd been extensive efforts for that. But I think this one definitely exceeded expectations. And, and, and it's a critical reminder of the fact that one small virus can disrupt our whole global systems, you know, wreak havoc, cause so much death and suffering um, in such a short space of time. And, you know, only 10 years ago, I had plenty of senior colleagues telling me the, the era of infectious diseases was over. So... Um, you know, some of us, some of us didn't quite believe that, but I think they're definitely a lot of So Russell, I have a build the infrastructure. I, Go I, I have a sociological view on that. Yeah. I think that we're going to see more um, the, the tempo of, of global infectious pandemics, epidemics build 
Um, the, the reasons for that, and this is most, is that there's intuition, not a lot, a little bit of science, is that some of the drivers are just picking up. So human ec ecological, the, the kind of ecological change, animal and human interactions, that's growing. Populations are growing. Uh, global movement is growing. And critically, um, and this is the bit I did not see coming for this pandemic, the rates of information flow are astronomically different from 1917. So in some respects, I was, I felt that the information pandemic actually was outstripping um, the, uh, the movement of the virus very, very early on. That, that's a bit of a bit of a metaphor, but actually it's a, that's a major trouble. It's a major challenge for the public health response. You know, the kind of misinformation um, uh, is out there and it's moving very, very rapidly. That was not the case in 1917. 1917, you were reading articles, sorry, letters in the Times that were talking about a bug somewhere in India, maybe, you know, some months ago. Uh, the, 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 the kind of the global social connectedness is fundamentally transforming uh, the landscape. Now, that, that's not a, it's kind of, it's based on my knowledge of some epidemiology, but I actually think uh, I've been saying to my folks, this won't be the last. Right, Kamalini, how long? I was asked that last year and I said, I think COVID's going to be the next pandemic. And then we got Delta. So, you know, we, we had all the drivers for, it, it's a disease that transmits prior to onset of symptoms. Um, uh, you know, it, it doesn't particularly have, a, so I, I agree with Ian that all the drivers for emergence of um, these sorts of things are amplifying. Um, but that's why I go back to structural disadvantage. So you look, whether it was last year, pre-Delta, you know, Wuhan strain, what you saw is that disease would concentrate in those who have the least structural capacity to isolate, to quarantine, to, to get tested, to vaccinate, and it would transmit and it then leaks into the wider community through the fact that those are the people who also, you know, stack our supermarket shelves, clean and feed our elders in aged care, you know, <laughs> mop the floors in our operating theatres. So I, I, you know, what I... It comes back to that that we we need to we need to think in a different way about how we're connected and how we invest in uh, in healthcare. And as Ian said, it goes well beyond healthcare. But I think healthcare practitioners, public health uh, experts, have a role, and they should be speaking beyond just epidemiology and health services. Right. So it is uh, just on time and there's still some fantastic questions there in the chat. Apologies that we haven't got through them all. Um, the highlights are what role has race and racism played in valuing community engagement and valuing certain populations. Lisa, maybe we can take that up in tomorrow's panel, which you're, you're part of. Um, I love to see the debate between senior members of the academy and that's part of the, the challenge in uh, in a virtual uh, meeting such as this, but nonetheless, Warwick and Ross have risen to the to the challenge. And uh, Warwick says it's of some concern that the lesson of the current pandemic seems often to be reduced solely to agile and rapid vaccine development, important as it is. To which Ross replied, "Also, science did not assume that vaccines were the only answer. Public health interventions, masks, physical spacing, hand washing, etc., and lately drugs." Um, Hugh Taylor's keeping us updated on all the latest news. The, the booster shots for Pfizer were approved this morning. Thanks, Hugh. Uh, we have questions from Sue Davis about uh, beyond understanding communities, cultures and beliefs, but also priorities and anxieties are integral to reducing not just infectious disease, but cardiometabolic diseases and so on. Thanks, Sue, for that. Um, there's a question about what would be the consequences if there are some Australian communities are open because of a reach of reaching a threshold and others remain locked. So there's clearly more to, to discuss. And uh, John Weiberg 
finishes off with the fracturing of the federation and the impasse between the feds and states has had on a major impact on the pandemic response. How can the academy play a role for the future with Ross picking up um, also on, on what is the role of the academy in, uh, in, in addressing many of the issues we've, we've called out today. So I think there's, there's plenty for us to continue to mull over over the rest of the meeting. I want to extend a very warm and, and wonderful thank you to our three speakers and panelists in this session, Professor Kamalini Lakuji, Professor Ian Anderson, and Professor Jody McVernon. I think it's been a wonderful session. Thank you for your participation.